OK, so my task is rather difficult and challenging. And it's about trying to discuss together and understand why Agile is so simple and at the same time is not easy at all to implement, right? So when you listen to someone explaining you about Agile, they tell you, well, it's all about inspect and adapt. There are some practices here, some stuff you need to do, and it's relatively simple to understand, but it's actually pretty difficult to implement in the right way. So the challenging thesis that I'm going to try to expose today in about 50 minutes, it's, uh, it's not possible to be able to do practices in a good way if you didn't understand the principle in the first place. But at the same time, you cannot understand the principle without making experience. So this is where Agile is really tricky. You can just follow practices by the book and still do it wrong, or you can try to understand the principle and see how this principle are connected with the practices, and then try to evolve those practices on one side and at the same side, um, learn to conceptualize better on those principles. What does it mean? Let's try to have a look. This was me, but you can Google. You find much more useful information and I'm not going to waste any minute to explain you who I am. And we go directly to the point. So principle, what is a principle? A principle is, as you can read there, a proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior. Ooh, yeah, big words. What does it mean? It means that some of the things we do in Agile are stemming out of a cultural mindset that we developed following certain principles. Agile values, Agile principle in particular. So if someone who is not coming from the same perspective is reading how to do Agile practices or how to adopt and implement a framework as simple as Scrum, can still do it wrong because they come from a different perspective and culture. To make this more clear, let's have a look at what a practice is. Because a practice is two things in particular. I like more the second one here. But the actual application or use of an idea, belief, and a method as opposed to theory relating to it. Means, you know, ever heard the, they say the difference between theory and practice is none in theory. But in practice, there is a big difference, <laughs> right? So. That's a little bit the trick also uh, when we talk about Agile. And the idea is that you get more practice by practicing. You get better at doing things, OK? But you get better at doing things if you have a set of belief and idea against which you can measure yourself, OK? A, a sort of ideal that you want to achieve, OK? So continuous improvement is not a word hanging in the air, but is how you, by practicing more and more, are able to implement those Agile principles and value in the most effective possible way. I make you some example now about practices used in Agile, okay, which are um, in many cases used in a very bad way. And people still tell you, hey, we are doing Agile. But then you look at those things and say, are you doing continuous integration? Sure, we are doing that. Are you doing test driven demand? Of course. Who doesn't do that? Are you doing pair programming? Yes, we do, okay. Are you doing daily stand-up? Of course we do. But then you go in and look at those things, and from your agile art and soul, you, you start feeling something is creaking. You know, all are opening everywhere. So why is that? And I decided, because in my coaching experience, I see these things happening everywhere. I have, I swear, millions of pictures of real situation when things really go wrong, OK? But I didn't consider that much of an ethic, bringing real picture from real customer to a conference and show how people are doing things wrong, right? Also because you start putting those funny black things on the eyes and everywhere, not to make people recognizable, and then you feel the content is gone. So what I did, because I'm flying a lot, okay, and I'm bored when I'm flying, I decided to create some cartoons myself, which I call the dog magis, okay? So the dog magis are, a group of crazy potatoes, OK, which are trying to follow Agile just by rules, OK? They read the rules, someone told them to do something, and they actually do. And they do it with all the good faith of the world, because they don't realize they are doing things wrong. 
So our pole boss is the product owner. Then we have Simon Cool, which is a scrum master. Then we have Martin Lou, which is a team member, okay, and Oliver Snake. Oliver Snake is this type of consultant guy who is coming from time to time and trying to sell you snake oil. You know? <laughs> and he's telling you, hey, I have the right tool for you. Try this one. This is the best thing ever. Okay? So let's go through some simple example of practices and try to understand how you can really do them wrong. So the daily stand-up meeting, a very simple thing. So the stand-up meeting, the practice behind that is very simple. We decide to stand up because by standing up, which is not so comfortable, people tend to focus and get the meeting done faster. Okay? So independent of the objectives or all the things you need to discuss, agile teams tend to do meeting by standing because by standing you have the possibility to actually focus very sharply on one thing and trying to get it done as fast as you can. Normally agile teams use this to synchronize their work daily, okay. In Scrum there is also a ceremony which is called the daily Scrum, an event, okay, which happens every day with a specific goal. So that's the practice. It's very simple. So everybody can do this even without being agile, okay. But in an agile context what we often see is something like that. We go at the daily stand-up meeting, you see the team lined up on the wall, probably <laughs> against the task board, and another guy sitting in front which is somehow the scrum master or the coach, and ask each of them, hey, what have you done yesterday? How much time you need to finish? Okay? And, and then keeps on updating his burn down chart. Because the management needs to see what we are doing, right? So this is a stand up meeting, right? But without having understood the principle behind, it, it feels completely wrong. So you are not doing what the meeting was supposed to do, which is Taking an agile team, which is a self-organizing unit, okay, there is no boss in an agile team, it's a self-organizing. And because they are self-organizing and nobody takes a decision on behalf of the team, but the team needs to decide themselves. They meet daily, and in Scrum is very clear, the goal of the daily Scrum is to renew the commitment that the team gave at the, at the planning meeting. Based on the learning of the past days, they have to look at the plan and say, hey, are we still going to make this goal or not? Look at that board and throw away everything which is not needed and find out everything else which we need to do in order to achieve the goal. It's a self-organizing thing, okay? So the real thing, this is what I call daily control meeting instead of daily stand-up meeting because the only goal of doing the meeting that way is to control that everybody worked eight hours the day before and they follow the plan, okay? Which is not what we want to do because the real principle behind is based on the fact that working in complex environment, okay, with rapid growth of information and always changing um, constraint around us, the only way to control the flow of work is by using empirical control. I explain you later what empirical control is, but the only way we can measure progress is by counting how many of the things we planned actually helped us moving forward toward our goal. Instead of trusting the time estimate and controlling the process by measuring the time, we say no, in a complex environment all the constraints constantly change around us and we have to keep on moving and adapting to everything changing. So the only way we have to measure progress is actually to measure the outcome over time. Okay? So fix the time every 24 hours and measure the outcome. It's much easier to measure empirically what happened rather than try to trust uh, forecast and estimate. Okay? Then we have another typical thing that all Agile teams do in various forms, which is the planning meeting. And the practice of the planning meeting is rather easy because we work in iterative small uh, increment of time and we need in this time box somehow to decide and define which part of what we normally call a product backlog, okay, or the list of the feature which need to be done Will the team be able to transform into running software with the level of quality we expect within the next iteration? That's the goal of the planning meeting. In XP there is a planning game, in Scrum there is a sprint planning meeting, in other agile approaches there are equivalent practices that agile team use. But often what we see is something like that. 
You have Mr. Product Owner who stays on the side and with the fastest possible machine gun is trying to shoot as many stories as possible to the team until the team is totally overwhelmed, they are sweating already, and they say, stop, is enough, okay? Obviously, and this is not so uncommon, I'm sure the first thing you do when you implement Agile, you have your traditional role, the project manager, which gets translated into product owner, then you get the team leader, which gets translated into scrum master, and the team remains the team. And all of a sudden, from one day to the next, you are doing scrum, right? The thing is, the project manager is still working as he was working before. You can tell him there is a planning meeting now, and he will say, great, then I tell the team what to do. And I start shooting them all the user story, because I like story as well, our measurable increment of work, so why not? So he's preparing his backlog and starts to shoot the backlog to the team until they say stop, okay? Or the scrum master, full of sense of pity uh, for the team, jumps in and say, please stop, okay? That's enough work to do, okay? But why is this happening? This is the shooting meeting, huh? uh, Why is this happening? Because if we look at the principle behind the planning, the principle is that to deliver working and valuable software at regular interval, and one important thing I will discuss later about the principle of iterative and incremental delivery and discovery that we do in Agile, because it's not only about execution, it's also about learning. So the biggest uh, advantage of adopting an iterative approach is not so much about being able to deliver the product faster or in smaller chunks, uh, but is aiming at learning while doing, because the hardest things to do in today's time with the time to market we have is to do the right thing. That's a big business risk we are trying to mitigate by delivering as often as possible and incrementally and verifying with the client that we are doing the right thing. And the important thing here is that the only way we have is to agree up front what we will demonstrate in order to learn if we build the right thing or not at the end of every iteration. If you don't think about that, and uh, as many project managers do, they already define the total scope of the project. They divide it in smaller chunks, okay? And then they plan the chunks into iteration that before were called milestone, and today we call them iteration, okay? What's the difference? The difference is you're actually iterating on the delivery <coughs> side, but you're not iterating on learning what needs to be done and if what you plan to do is actually the right thing. It's, it's like if someone would come to you and ask you to draw the Mona Lisa, okay? Then you take the Mona Lisa, they give you a picture of the Mona Lisa, perfect, already ma made, no requirement to be discussed. That's what we need to produce. Then you cut the Mona Lisa in 16 smaller square blocks, okay? And you plan these square blocks into iteration and you tell the team to paint exactly each of the square blocks like that. What's the difference? At the end of every iteration, you don't have a shippable product which you can inspect together with your client, because if you go to your client and you have a small box like this with the perfect Mona Lisa eye, what type of feedback you think he will give you? Where is my picture? I want to see the whole thing, okay? And that's where Agile comes to help with the iterative and incremental approach. And this is why planning meeting is important to define what we think we can inspect in a few weeks' time. Then we talk about pair programming. Pair programming is a very debated thing. And, and one thing is, it's rather simple if you look at the description of the practice. Because what he's telling you is that according to XP, which is extreme programming, is where the practice of pair programming was invented, all code can be sent into production is created by two people working together at a single computer. And pair programming increases software quality without impacting time to deliver. Oh, and everyone, immediately the manager said, what, two people working with one keyboard and I'm paying double? That's the first reaction, right? Of course, if you do something like this, where a very experienced guy has a problem and needs help and wants to pair on a story, and the newbies of the team, which never did that before, wants to learn, notice the JavaScript for dummies book reflected in the, <laughs> in the mirror there, and he said, yeah, I can learn if you want. I can come and pair with you, okay? But this is not the goal of pairing, because mentoring and teaching is not pairing. And many teams think that pairing is about knowledge transfer. But the goal of pairing is producing high-quality software 
and increasing the quality of design by focusing with four eyes and two brains on solving complex problems faster. Because when you are alone and you have a complex problem, tendentially you end up looping in the same pattern of thought. So the only way to get out of it is having someone beside him that is kicking you and saying, hey, why you don't do that way? Oh, yes, it's so simple, but I couldn't think about it myself. Okay? So the goal of pairing clearly is not pairing for nothing and programming for free, which is what the <laughs> manager likes. I'm paying two people, they are sitting there, only one keyboard, we save cost. We only need one computer every two people. No, it's not really that the, the sense of pair programming. The sense of pair programming, and you can read that at extremeprogramming.org, which I consider a relevant source of information in this case, it is counterintuitive. But two people working at a single computer will add as much functionality as two working separately on two different computers, except that it will be much, much higher quality with increased quality becomes saving later in the project. You know that if you produce with lower quality, you get those nasty things that you call bugs that nobody wants to have. And everybody blames, hey, we are always interrupted in our sprint because we get bugs. Yes, ask yourself who produced those bugs in the first place. So look in the mirror and start to blame that guy, okay, because it was you probably. So the only way we have, and this is, we learn it from Lean, to deal with bugs that in their nature are unplanable, unorganizable, and whatever else, okay, the only way we have to manage those bugs is to find the process and practices which allow us to produce less of those things. Okay? And pair programming is definitely one thing which is helping you produce in code which is cleaner, which is easier to read, and probably contains also less defect. One note that is also on the website, remember one thing, pair programming is not is mentoring. So don't sell your manager that with pair programming you're faster and what you're doing is actually knowledge transfer. Because that's another thing and it's not going to be faster. How many times do you have the super experienced guy that said, hey, if I do it alone, I do it much faster than with these guys on my neck. Okay? And that is what I call the syndrome. You know, in pair programming, you always have a driver and a navigator. Okay? When I see those situations, I call it, this is the syndrome of the taxi driver. You know, the guys in front is always driving, the other one is sitting on the back and enjoying the ride. And you pay for it. So if, if you want to do that explicitly, then call it mentoring and say, we are doing taxi driving. Look at what I'm doing and learn, okay? That, that's not pairing. You can do pairing everywhere also, not only on coding, but in testing and many other disciplines. Let's go to test-driven development, another hugely misunderstood agile practice. So the practice is also very simple. It's about uh, um, understanding that in a software development process, okay, uh, if you relay on small repetition and constantly testing the fact that the code you wrote works, okay, you are progressing faster in the development and also normally you come out with a much cleaner design. Okay? We will see later how this comes out from. But what we see often implemented when we do coaching is instead of test-driven development, we have a situation where a guy comes in with already all the design defined, okay, and someone told him, hey, you can do 2D on this one. Then he's hanging all the design on the board, and half an hour later, he decides after having tried out, you see, he's sweating the guy, he's trying to write test for a design which is already existing, which most likely is not testable. So the other advantage of doing test-driven development, and this is what I call design-driven testing, because it's the other way around. So the design comes first, and then someone tries to jump in some test on something which is in its nature deeply untestable, okay? It's monolithic, has not been designed to be testable. And one of the advantage of doing test-driven development actually is that by focusing on the problem and trying to solve the problem in smaller increment of value, you normally come out with a much cleaner design and much more effective code, which is easier to maintain and to evolve. and means less bugs. Okay? Less code to carry around also means less inventory. So do the minimal needed. And the principle behind that is in the Agile Manifesto and is called simplicity, which is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. So the more you, the less you do, the better. Okay? 
And the principle is in, in the spirit of simplicity, and here you go, team focus on implementing the minimal amount of code needed to, that fulfills the test. And in this respect, design and architecture will be emerging out of the need of fulfilling clear business tests or clear business requirements. Okay? By doing so, the code will always contain the minimal amount of code lines which are needed to solve a business problem. So you don't have extra stuff around just because it would be nice. And this is a nice approach because programmers are creative. All of us are, right? You are not? No, none of you. So you are bored because your products are so annoying that the only thing you do is anyway applying the simplicity principle, which is great. Okay. But generally speaking, what happens is, oh, we need to do this. What programmers, ah, if they ask this for sure, they will ask also for that. So I'm very clever and I start building into the code the capability of solving also the future problem, which is not yet being defined. Okay. And, and this is a, a sort of attitude that many developers have and the TDD practice is actually helping to get away with that because you focus only on solving one problem at a time. Okay? Then we go with another thing and this is the abominos of all of it. So it's been a fancy word in 2011 because in 2012 was co continuous delivery the fancy word and God knows what will be in 2013. You heard already what is the next level of buzzwording? Cloud integration, okay, but that's not really process related. Anyway, continuous integration. The practice is simple. By accelerating to the maximum level the feedback loop that we have on a continuously integrated product, we learn more if, and faster if we did the right thing or not. So the whole goal of continuous integration, which comes of help especially when you have a lot of things working on the same product uh, is to learn as fast as possible that the amount of code you are going to check in into the repository which will become a part of the product even if it's just 10 lines of code is working or not. And the goal is continuous integration should be as fast as possible because in the course of a day developers shouldn't be scared to check in the code many times possibly every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes because then you know if you break some tests and when integrating it doesn't work, the mistake must be in those 10 lines of code. If you merge and integrate the product only once a week, and you probably wrote thousands of lines of code with multiple teams, probably hundreds of thousands, I don't know, tens of thousands for sure, and the point is, go and search for a bug. It's like finding a needle, you know, in a, in a big warehouse. Where is it? We will never find it. So the idea of continuous integration is actually to save time to the developer by checking as often as possible if the whole product integrated is still working and fulfilling the test. What we see most of the time is what I call continuous disintegration because what actually happens is that people don't understand that continuous integration is not about installing Jenkins, Team City, Hudson or whatever other nice software you want to install for doing continuous integration, but it's a discipline. Continuous integration is in here. If you don't think continuously integrating whatever you do, you will never be able to implement the infrastructure. The infrastructure is supportive of an attitude, of a discipline that the team build in order to successfully release shippable software as often as possible. And that only happens if everybody is committed in doing it. So if continuous integration is imposed as an infrastructure from the outside, what you typically see, a team which doesn't use it, so they close the line and say, no, this is too slow. We, we know we are good at writing code, trust us. We write our code and we check in directly to the repository, no problem at all. On the other side, team is using continuous integration with no test implemented at all because they assume that somebody else will test. So they keep on checking in and their build is always green. Guess why? Unless they break the test of somebody else, they won't realize that their code doesn't work. On the other side, there are guys who are trying really hard to run after things and make a very, very tested line with a lot of, of, of automated tests. But at the end of the day, everything ends up in the same pot. And you know what comes out at the end. And then you see the ops guy, which are normally one level below, running around and bringing back all the 
yeah, that brown thing, smelly stuff, you know? And they come back and say, hey, this thing doesn't work. Can you fix it? And then the fixing game starts because guys running around with the red card in their hand saying, we have a bug in production. We need to stop everything, fix it, okay? And then developers said, you see, continuous integration doesn't work. Why are we doing it, okay? Because it's here where it needs to work first. So if we look at the principle behind, agile teams are seeking constantly to accelerate feedback loop. So they learn faster. In particular, team value validated learning more. Sorry. Oops. That was nice. I found a new button. So uh, agile team valid uh, um, appreciate validated learning more than assumption based on learning. What does it mean? Validated learning means, hey, look, we tried that. This is an evidence, a running product, we know it's working, okay? Rather than saying my friend or the cousin of my friend read the book and told him that actually this would work. That's not knowledge, okay? Those are still assumptions because the, the knowledge that Agile team likes is the validated one. We have evidence, we build a case, this is an experiment, it's working. So the faster we can learn by constantly integrating and implementing new feature into our product, the better we will be able to deliver value and quality to our customer, okay? Then the review meeting. I'm coming at the end of the development cycle. Why a review meeting exists? Because from time to time, product owner and team and possibly stakeholder needs to provide real feedback to a product that they implemented to understand if it's something the real user will be able to use. And this is not only about uh, functionality, it's about usability, it's about look and feel, it's about is it solving our problem for real or not? Is it overwhelming? Did we interpret the problem in the right way? Did we solve it in the right way? So there are a lot of information that no automated test will be able to give you. You can ask acceptance test to the client, but when people see the tool and start to walk around with the tool, they will understand that there is something which can be implemented better. There is something that we forgot or they forgot to tell us. Because the worst problem we have, and this we have to be very honest, is what we generally call uncertainty. But there is another one which is deeper than uncertainty. That is, we don't know what we don't know. Because if we would know what we don't know, we could ask questions and get some sort of answer. But because sometimes the domain between user and the development team who is implementing a, a solution is so big and so far away, we don't even know what we don't know. And that's the worst thing that can happen. So the best way to figure out what we don't know is to come to the client on the domain side and show them something and say, hey, you like this. And as fast as possible. So if after two weeks they tell you, hey, what the heck did you implement? Then we learn something. We learn that we didn't understood in the first place, we didn't ask the right question, and we probably learn also that the customer is making a lot of assumptions. This is business risk, and we want to mitigate that business risk. And unfortunately, most of the time, what we see when teams do review meetings and meet again for the product, it feels more or less like a compliance review. And they still think in the project management way. So the guy come and each individual team member goes to the product owner with his story in his hand. He's trying to demonstrate it and the product owner says, no, I don't want that. So you are a bad guy. Instead, if you did the right thing, you are a good guy, okay? The review meeting is not about checking compliance. It's not about verifying that the team did what they promised. It's about verifying the current state of the product and deciding if the current order of your product backlog is still the best way of achieving the vision you are trying to achieve and the value you are trying to deliver to the market. Because product owners, Scrum Master and team, development team in Scrum are on the same level. There is no hierarchy. And they are all collaborating with special tasks or special assignment if you want. And they have to collaborate to build the best possible product as fast as possible. So it's not about reviewing that the team member did what they promised. You give it that as a given because it's a shared responsibility. As a Scrum team, we all want to bring the product forward. The team does it by implementing high quality software. The product owner does it by making sure they are doing the right thing, constantly talking with the product owner, with the stakeholder, sorry, and verifying that you are building the right thing. And the Scrum master or coach does it by helping everybody else 
being as fast and effective as possible. Because speed is a very important factor in Agile. The fastest we are, the fastest we learn, and the fastest we can mitigate risk. Because learning and knowledge is the best weapon you have against risk. Risk is we don't know things. And so the faster you can learn and the faster you can build knowledge, the faster you can mitigate risk. Okay, business risk, technical risk, social risk, schedule and cost risk, whatever risk you want to talk about, those are the things that you can mitigate. Okay, and that's in a nutshell agile. But still, you can do all the practice and exactly mechanically do whatever is written in whatever book and you will still get it wrong. Because you need what we call the agile reading glasses. So you need the right mindset to understand how these practices and framework work. And now I try to give you a very short overview on this. This we already discussed. What does it mean understanding the principle? It means that when someone comes outside, from outside the context of agile, needs to get some things right. And I'm not talking about the obvious agile manifesto or agile principle, because those still feels a little bit fluffy and a little bit, you know, hanging in the air. Some people call dogma. So that's not a religion, that's an indication. That's an emergent wish and a declaration of intent of some people which said, we believe that working software is more valuable than comprehensive documentation because we have empirical evidence of it. Ever went to a customer bringing him, hey, look, this is the user manual, this is how the product should look like, but it doesn't work. How happy is it if you do that? We are working on it. Or you go to the customer and say, look, if this is a product, and they say, wow, it's exactly what I expected. We are a bit short on the documentation, but you know, if the usability is right, you shouldn't use much of the documentation at all. Okay? So understanding the principle, what we call the agile reading glasses. So whenever you get someone completely alien to agility, give him these glasses first. So we will understand how to interpret the practices. And these are four important things. Iterative and incremental, lean thinking, pull principle, and empirical process control. I'm going to make some empirical experiment to explain you what empirical control is. But before getting there, we need to understand what is the standard way in which we normalize process um, in everyday life. So the, the method we learn to control the flow of work is based on what we call defined process control. Defined process control is called defined process control because you need to define the workflow before starting working. So typically you define an input activity, a transfer, sorry, an input, a transformation activity which produces an output, okay? You have a requirement, the business analyst analyzes and produces a specification. And then this specification gets in the end of a designer which designs and creates a design. The design gets in the end of a developer which develops and writes the code and then you have the code written. And then it goes in the end of a tester and so on. So what I just created here is called workflow, right? So we call it define process control because we need to define the workflow before starting working. And then we instantiate that workflow into a plan that we all know what it is. And then we measure by asking those expert people, which are the roles, how much time will take to transform a requirement into a specification? How much time will it take to transform a specification into a design? And then we create a plan based on estimates. Because we ask experts, we believe that they are so good because they did it for so many years that eventually it will happen. And exactly as they predicted it, okay? In some companies it's actually happening, but I don't tell you how they make it, okay? Sometimes I've seen estimated pump, estimation pumped up up to a factor eight. And then the company was very proud of making it to the plan every time. And I said, well, if you're looking for compliance, this is great. But if you're looking for effectiveness, we have a long way to go. Very long, OK? So it's not about making it to the estimate. It's about delivering the value as fast as you can and be able to verify. So this type of control works very well. But as you can imagine, the thing you need to know are where are we starting from? Where are we finishing? So what is the expected final product? How exactly look like? And you need to have done this at least one time to be able to define a workshop, which, uh, a workflow, sorry, which is based on a minimal realistic stance of what is actually needed to do this. 
So this type of process control is very useful when you do the same thing all over again. So when you produce appliances or you produce cars or you produce telephones, whatever, that works because you produce multiple co copy of the same thing and then you fine tune and measure the time at every step and try to optimize the flow of work. Okay? By increasing the throughput of the whole workflow. Okay? That's great. But the variable on which you apply control is mostly time because average lead time, that's time. Okay? Cycle time, we always measure time. And we measure time empirically, which works very well. We screw up when someone asks us, hey, how long it will take? And there we are asking a guess. And the guess as such is never accurate, is not even precise. So when complexity grows, and how many times, honestly, you implemented the same requirement in your life? How many times? If you did that, how many times you did it the same way? OK, no end at all now. Thank God. And the reason is we learn. So we did it once. We learned that there was be probably a, a better way of doing it. And then next time, we did it better. OK? So can we reuse the same workflow in that case? We'll be stupid. Right? Because every time we do it again, we make more experience and we learn it better. So in complex environment where things are changing around us anyway, and I will try to explain you what a complex environment is now. So let's make a test. These cars are going to move soon when I push the button. I want you, so I, I wake you again. And you are going to win a super valuable 5Y cars on Scrub and Agile, okay? If you win this game. Everybody will get the right answer. There is an imaginary yellow line over there. I want you to count in both directions how many cars will pass that line in the next 20 seconds. OK? Are you ready? Go. <laughs> 42 would be a nice answer. I, I, really, I really tried. I admit I tried very hard. OK, so we have five seconds more. A little bit more, seven. OK, so how many of you believe we're at least 25 cars? Uh, 40, 50, 60, more than 60. OK, so you all want to get the deck of cars. <laughs> so I was hinting at it, but actually are more than 60. 60 car on that line. So. You can get a ball for a, starting, for a starting, and next you can pull up the cars. More than 60. Um, what the problem with traffic? This is a simple example of a dynamic complex system. Okay? Why is it complex to count the car? And why it's difficult to predict how many cars will pass the line? Because even if there are constraints uh, controlling the way this system should behave, which, for example, is, OK, you have to drive 70 kilometers per hour, right? And at that speed, we probably need to keep at least 50 meter distance between two vehicles, right? And there are lanes on the ground as constraint. But how many people do you think, when you go really driving, will follow those rules? Every agent in, the, in, moving, in movement in this system is called an agent, is a driver of a car. And every driver, even if they all know the rules, behave in his own way depending on what he believes is right or wrong. And by doing so, they implicitly change the system behavior. Because their behavior, for example, a guy which comes here on the right line and starts blinking everybody, makes everyone else move on the right side. And by moving on the right side, they generate a queue on the right side. So the system behaves in an unpredictable way, even if the rules of play are the same. The constraints remain the same, but because the agent move independently with, from one another, they are not coordinated in any way, they keep on changing the system by participating into the system. This is what we define a complex environment. So in this type of environment, and everybody always says, oh, we are complex, our projects are really complex and complicated or whatever. In this type of environment, the best way you have to keep control over the flow of work is by using empirical control. An empirical control is very simple. You draw a line on the street and you count the outcome coming out of that line at regular interval of time. Because any prediction of what will be the flow 
that the car used inside that highway, any prediction on how much time it will take for a car to go from one point to the next will be totally silly and best guessed. Because there is no recognizable cause and effect up front in such a system. That's by definition. And I don't want to bother you with process control theory because it's very boring. I don't even want to bother you with complexity. I just want to tell you, stop asking your team to estimate time and count how many finished features they produce every week. That's empirical control. I don't care how you did it. I don't care who did it. Show me the money. Show me where my money went in the last week. That's the best way you can do, OK? Especially because depending on the size and the complexity of a story, you might choose as a team different way of working on it. If it's something very similar to something you already did, maybe you have a best practice to solve it. If it's a complex problem you never did, maybe you want to tackle the problem as a team altogether. So there are various type of processes that you can adopt depending on the input that you get in every moment in time. But still, because in a complex system, the only way to keep control is to keep as many constant as possible defined under your control. Don't use the time as a variable. Very bad idea. Fix the time. Show me the money every week. Don't change the team member. Because every time you change a team member, you inject even more diversity and complexity into an already complex system. So leave the team stable. If you leave the team stable and you leave the time stable, you will see that after a while, the team reach what we call a sustainable pace, or they should. And after a while, you will see that every week, they roughly produce the same amount of feature, OK, in a way or another. You have to normalize the flow. You have to do a lot of things that we will discuss briefly. The pool principle, another very highly misunderstood thing. If you don't understand how pool work and why agile team work with the pool principle, you will get a lot of agile practices wrong. And the reason is simple. It's not about the mechanic of the pool and the push system, which are well known to everybody. It's about how people behave in an environment where it's driven by a push system and how people behave in an environment which is driven by a pull system. So typically what we see in a push system environment is that what we push are rules, are processes, and what we want to check is compliance to these rules. The system is based on individual, is based on enforcement of rules, so the way we check that the system works based on the assumption that the plan was right is by measuring individual performance against the workflow and the plan we made. So we check the outcome, the output of the single activity is good, it took the estimated time, great. And we assume that because it happened, we will get the product we want at the end of our flow. Okay? Very bad idea. Instead, when we work in a pool system, we don't care who does what, because we focus on value and we allow a team rather than an individual, which has all the skills which are needed to actually deliver value, to pull as much of that value into the team by collecting knowledge, by asking stakeholders, by learning new practices, and we control the system through collaboration. Collaboration is a subtle form of control because when you are in a team and you start helping each other and collaborating to deliver value, you will see how much people start to look in each other's eyes and there is no way that someone is sleeping around. And there is no way someone won't feel part of that thing. Or if, you will find it out very fast. Okay? Because the team will control themselves. We are all on the same boat. We are pulling value, we are pulling knowledge and tools which would allow us then to generate the value. Then we have the lean thinking, a little bit the big umbrella behind the Agile. And there is one part of lean which has been highly misunderstood also by General Motors and uh, other guys like John Womack who actually uh, defined for the first time lean because lean is not invented by the Japanese because the Japanese just work that way. So the guys who invented lean are the Americans who observed in many phases how the Japanese were working and call that lean because it's just simply compared to very highly bureaucratic processes used in the Western world at the time, which were based on defined process control and a lot of other roller hierarchy things, the lean approach of the Japanese was rather light. Okay? So they defined the famous 3M of lean. 3M, Muri, Mura, and Muda. These are three Japanese words 
Number one can be roughly translated in overburden. And overburden means if you don't work with high quality, you will produce poor result, which translate into rework. And rework lands up on your own to-do list. And when you get a to-do list, which is ever growing, you feel more and more stress. And under stress, you deliver even less quality. Okay, so that's a catch-22 problem. You keep on running after your own tail, and that's not a good way of working. So what the Japanese said, whenever you see this happening, every employee is not only allowed, but is required to stop the flow and remove the overburdened situation. Can you imagine that in an American culture? Where everybody is remotely steered with a remote control and everyone has to execute on the to-do list? Okay, no wonder the American had an hard time for 25 years trying to implement Nien right. And then they went forward and they said, well, we learn not to overload people and the resources in a process if you are using machines. And after that, we also had Mura. And Mura is another source of dysfunction in a system. We talked about system thinking many times in this conference. Many speakers mentioned it. I remember Andrea Provaglio, for sure, Pavel mentioned something about systems and how the dynamic of the flow work into a system. But Mura is about normalizing the flow. Whenever we have an unnormalized flow, think this is your to-do list at work. And this asks you, hey, change the color of the button from red to green. Awesome, I can do that in a few minutes, done. The second one is four times as big. The third one is 20 times as big. So when you read the third one, and this in the same context, your brain starts to spin around and says, alarm. You must have misunderstood something, because it's not possible that in the same to-do list, we get three things one after the next, where the complexity grows so much. Your brain simply doesn't accept that. It's telling you it's an ambush. Don't commit to that. Someone tries to gate you in some way, OK? So what the Japanese said, whenever you see a flow which is uneven, try to normalize it. <coughs> try to make sure your backlog is groomed. So the backlog grooming is not that someone one day awoke and decided, let's make the story small and estimate them. The goal of backlog grooming is to have a normalized flow. Because if you have a constant input, then the team can easily reuse best practices and good practice to work out one feature after the next in a structured way, instead of having a completely new problem to solve every time. Because you, you smash them, the full elephant in the room, and they need to find a way to go around it. OK? The last but not least, the most famous M of, of Lean, which is Muda, which is removing all non-value adding activity from your process. Waste, OK? Unfortunately, many people who try to implement Lean only focused on this aspect and forget flow normalization and overburden. So what happens, you have normally a workflow, you start removing activity that you think are not needed, and you don't realize that people around the place where you remove the activity start to get overloaded of work. And the flow all of a sudden starts to get uneven because you didn't rebalance the flow after having removed some pieces of your process. Okay? That is what all lean factory we are doing, and this is what all agile teams should do as well. If when we say empower the team in a lean factory has a very clear meaning, it's not just a slang, misabused English word, but it's about allowing, not only allowing, but requiring every single employee working in your organization to stop the chain, to stop the flow of work whenever they detect overburden, flow which are not normalized, and wasteful activity. Then sit down, drink tea together, calm down, okay? Try to fix the process by adding or removing things which would normalize the flow again, and then start working again. Because we know that fixing defect later costs 10 times as much as taking care of those defects immediately. I invite you to read The Machine That Changed the World, the book from Womack, written in 1989, or The Toyota Way, which is the Toyota official description of, the, of their production system. There are scary stories about Americans participating in a work unit, and they have been told, whenever you see a mistake, stop. Even if you did that, call the whole team and let's try to find a way to solve the mistake. What do you think Americans did the first time? There are stories of a guy trying to put um, uh, nuts to cover you know, the wheel of a car, and then the nut is slipping and accidentally scratching the, the alloy 
uh, thing which was already painted. And then what he did, instead of stopping and calling the team, he looked around, nobody has seen him, Shh, don't say anything, go ahead. Then the car is finished, come at the end of the chain, the whole team walk around the car to check that everything is fine. The team leader comes in and said, hey, we have a will to change. Who was that? Who did that? And then nobody for like a minute said anything. Then the poor guy said, it was me. And he said, great, show me how you did that. And these guys were, wow, they are not blaming me. He wants to know how I did that. And I explained him, and then he taught me at that moment in time. He showed, look, if you do it with your finger, and you try to steer with the finger until the bolt gets into the, into the, um, into the hole correctly, then you can remove the finger, and you will see it's not happening again. So in that moment, American people realized that the Japanese were not joking. They were trying to teach them how to do simple things better in order to avoid mistakes. Because to bring the car back on the bridge, lift it up, remove all four bolts again, go and get a new piece, come back and fix it again, is costing at least 10 times more than if you would have done that immediately. And in that moment, people said, ah, this is why you're asking me to say immediately when I made a mistake because you can teach me how to fix it. And this type of mentality is hard to get across, but this is what every Agile team should do. And then the last thing is iterative and incremental development by understanding that iterative and incremental is not a way of laying out a plan in milestones, okay? It's a way of saying, look, we have an idea, we want to verify that idea, and we add some value. And then we get real feedback. And the client said, oh, I like the tree, but I would like to have a little bit more of leaf, a bigger trunk, whatever, OK? And then we improve the idea, and we verify it again. And then we go ahead one step after the next until we are done, because the customer says it's done. So upfront, potentially, we didn't know how many iterations we need to make on this product until getting it to done. But the idea of done changed, because done is not anymore going from 0 to 100% of our plan, but it's going from 0 to 100% of customer satisfaction. That's another dimension of measuring done. It's about delighting your customer by doing the most valuable thing to them and giving them something that they can use. So the plan, if you like to plan and use defined control or empirical control, are just infrastructure that we build in order to manage business risk, technical risk, resource risk, scheduling cost risk, and social risk. This is what we do. It's the way we manage risk. The fact that your client needs to be happy with the money he gave you remains. The choice of using an agile approach instead of a standard, more conventional approach, which is based on defined control, is simply another way of managing that risk, which instead of denying the fact that complexity and uncertainty exist, try to cope with it every day. In that way, you will get closer to the expected result over time. Remember that because we don't know if every increment of value will be the last one, we have to make sure that it is inspectable, meaning we get feedback from the client. Because if we can't get, we fail. We add value, otherwise the client asks you, what the hell should I come and see if you didn't add any value? Show me something more, otherwise I'm not coming and giving you feedback. And it's high quality, because we don't know if it will be the last one. Only in this way, we know it's ready to ship. And if they say, I like it, give it to me, we say, OK, no problem. It's yours. Take it, OK? So what? Final words. When snake oil guy is coming to you and telling you, hey, look, this tool is much better than the one you were using before. You see the lumberjack is there, he's cutting the tree with his ax, and everything is OK. Right? Then the snake oil guy say, hey, use this new tool. It's called Scrum Chainsaw. OK? Then you go ahead. So everyone use Scrum Chainsaw. It's much better than the ax. OK? And then the guys buy this Scrum Chainsaw and, and keep on cutting the tree like that. And then blames, look, this tool is heavier than the one I had before. It's cutting much worse the tree. OK? Nobody taught him how to use the new tool. And that's the problem. It's not only about the tool and the framework. It's about understanding how you can use it and what's in it for you. So how does this tool fit into your company culture? How does it fit into your organization? What do you need to change? OK? So Agile is very simple, but is extremely hard to implement because it's not just about tool, it's not just about practices, 
but it's a constant learning process which switch between understanding the principle, realizing why the tools are built the way they are built, and through the practice using this tool, conceptualizing even better and understanding why the principles are the way they are. Okay? So my recipe at the end, unfortunately I haven't any because it's hard. That's the only recipe I have. But there are some ingredients which will for sure help you move forward. Number one, focus on value, not on compliance to rules. So don't try to define something and test it on people. Set a goal, set clear constraints, and let people find the best way to deliver value within those constraints. And use empirical control, because in that way, you don't need to put KPI on a defined process. The only KPI that matters is how much value you deliver every week, or every two weeks, or every three weeks. Okay? And that makes you independent from the process. It's a very good KPI to measure. It's a KPI which means also cash in at the end. Okay? Number two, understand the principle and then learn the practices. Don't start the other way around. It's very dangerous. Okay? It's very dangerous to assume you understand the test-driven development because you read what it is about. And I know some of you started yesterday doing the workshop back there and they realized that it's very hard to actually write a test without having a minimal of infrastructure code already in place. And a lot of people started writing infrastructure code before writing the test because they didn't even know wh what to address with the test. What I'm testing, there is nothing to test. Okay? It's difficult. You need to practice a lot and understand the principle behind it. Number three, assimilate the principle by practicing more and improve the practices by conceptualizing better the principle. So this is a constantly learning cycle. You learn a new level of principle, you practice better, you change the practice maybe, you improve the practice, and by doing that you understand better the principle, which allows you to refine the practices even more. And after a while, build your own practices, because once you learn the principle, out there there are best practices, but best practices are not best in every environment, unfortunately. Best practices only work in a simple domain. If you want, if you really have complicated and complex domain, you have to build your own good practices. And good practices for you are not good practices for me because they are dependent on the context. And the only way you can be sure that your good practices will still be agile is if you understood well the principle. Otherwise, it's very easy to fall back to the practices you always used, which come from your old way of working, which inevitably will constrain self-organization and other agile things, and you will inevitably fall back to the old way of working, sooner or later, because everything becomes more difficult to change. Okay? So this was my four point to get home. I'm only five minutes late. Six, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I did the best I could. <laughs> Here there is some food for thought and an, an, a highlight, uh, an highlight from three or four days ago. Two guys of the Croatian community translated our Agile book in Croatian. So you don't even have to make big effort. Thanks to Damien. Stand up. Stand up. And he's getting a Don't Panic super sticker. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, and Marco, where is Marco? Back there. You also get a Don't Panic super sticker. OK? <laughs> Thank you to them. We have now a Croatian translation. You can find it on InfoQ. So you go on InfoQ.com. And you look in the Agile books for free. And there's a PDF version for free in Croatian. OK? In the Agile. Agile HR. OK. I don't know where it is. Agile.hr Agile. 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 also. Ah, sorry. There is also a book. There is a link. Okay? Sorry, Great. Uh, yes. Yes, The Machine That Changed the World. That's the book written by uh, John Womack in 89. And is highly based on the observation he had of uh, the partnership between Toyota and General Motors, NUMI, in North California, where with other three process managers from General Motors, he went there to see how the Japanese really worked and tried to learn lean from them. Okay? Then these are a lot of other books. You will get the PDF version of the slide. It's already on SlideShare there with other interesting things. And if you click on that one, you will also get the book directly. Okay? 
The book is Agile Transition, what you need to know before starting. And there's a lot of things about culture, there's a lot of things about more detail about what we discussed today and a couple of suggestions on how to approach an agile change. Any other question that I can help you with? You can have a ball. <laughs> so the balls are close by, so the one who comes here first can get them. There is plenty of stuff here if you want. Also some planning poker, business value card and everything. I don't want to bring it back to the plane. It was heavy enough to bring it here, so I'm going to leave it to Croatia. Okay. Thank you very much again for your time.